I will open this meeting of the Usher County Commission. We will begin with the mode of silent meditation and prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. on prevailing wage in West Virginia and outside of West Virginia. We have a two o'clock meeting for joint meeting of the Upshur County EMS and ESP to discuss the possibility of a mutual aid agreement between the Upshur County EMS and ESP. That meeting will take place at the Office of Emergency Management, I believe. Is that correct? Or will be here at the courtroom? I believe we are already here. Here, okay. Uh, so we move on then until 9.15. We have a few things to handle. I'll have uh, Jackie give the uh, minutes from last meeting. Good morning. Good morning, Jackie. The County Commission of Upshur County, West Virginia, held their regular meeting at the Courthouse Annex on Thursday, July 2, 2015, at 9 a.m. J.C. Rafferty called the meeting to order. There were present J.C. Rafferty Commissioner, Troy Brady Commissioner, Terry Cutright Commissioner, Terry Wallace, County Administrator, Tabitha Perry, Assistant County Administrator, and Jacqueline Denkwalker, Secretary. The meeting began with a moment of silent meditation and prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. All motions passed unanimously unless otherwise stated. After reading of the minutes on motion by Terry Cutright, seconded by Troy Brady, the Commission approved the regular meeting minutes of June 25, 2015 as submitted. After discussion on motion by Jason Rafferty, with no second, the motion to approve state Steve Abel to fill the vacant position on the Upshur County Civil Service Board set to expire 12-31-2017 died due to lack of a second. Commissioner Cutright recused himself from the vote due to personal relationship. After discussion on motion by Terry Cutright, second and by Troy Brady, the commission approved the employment of Deborah Barnes as temporary part-time deputy assessor per request from Double Price Assessor. The requested salary was adjusted to the rate of $22 per hour per agreement between Mr. Rice and Ms. Barnes. Ms. Barnes will work not more than 25 hours per week with her salary to be paid out of the revaluation. Effective date of employment is July 13, 2015. Jerry Kimball, West Virginia Classic Wheels Car Club member, provided a review of events and activities on July 24 and 25. The fourth annual Blast from the Past proceeds will benefit the distribution of car seats and smoke detectors for newborns at St. Joseph's Hospital. After discussion on motion by Troy Brady, second by Terry Cutright, the commission approved a donation in the amount of $250 and 10 one-day pool passes to the Buchanan Upshur Recreational Park pool to be used for fundraising. After discussion on motion by Terry Cutright, second by Troy Grady, the commission approved and authorized the president to sign the inspection agreement with Brewer and Company of West Virginia Incorporated at the annual sum of $1,600 for fire protection for the premises of the Upshur County Emergency 911. Carrie Wallace requested to defer action on agenda item number five until after the 10:15 a.m. meeting with Sheila Adams, Chief Tax Deputy. <coughs> J.C. Rafferty reviewed the following for your information items: number one, correspondence from Robert Pennington, P.E. Deputy State Highways Engineering Program and Planning and closing statewide transportation improvement plan listing of proposed amendments to be approved to the to be approved 2014 through 2019 STIP. Two, correspondence from Stephen Canterbury, Chairperson, West Virginia Court Security Board, informing Upshur County Commission 
the court security fund grant in the amount of $2,360 has been approved for the purpose of enhancing the courts, the county's court security. Three Upshur County Tobacco Prevention Coalition, the Toll of Tobacco in West Virginia article. Four Upshur County Family Resource Network newsletter, July 2015. Five Upshur County Family Resource Network Directors Report, June 2015. Six agendas and or notice of meeting is listed. Me uh, seven meeting minutes as listed. Eight meetings as listed. Nine appointments needed or upcoming as listed. The commission approved all invoices for payment. The commission approved all vacation orders. Dirk, Bur Dirk Burnside did not appear for his 9.45 a.m. appointment to discuss the parking lot at the emergency medical services location. The meeting will be rescheduled to a future agenda. The commission recessed at 9.47 a.m. The commission reconvened at 10 a.m. Shane Zimmerman, Emergency Site Protection LLC representative, appeared before the commission to formally introduce Emergency Site Protection LLC as a new business in Upshur County. Mr. Zimmerman assured that the company does not wish to compete with Upshur County EMS, but wishes to complement and work with them. Mr. Zimmerman requested Upshur County Commission to recognize ESP as an emergency service pro provider and allow ESP access to the siren radio system. This does not commit them to a binding contract. Mr. Zimmerman further requested 911 to activate their services in the event that they are specifically requested and to activate their services if UC EMS is unavailable, typically after seven minutes. Steve Lehner, E911 Communications Center Director, inquired about the company's availability for backup, ser for backup services for the UCEMS. J.C. Raffi advised that the, a mutual aid agreement would require planning and requested Kerry Wallace to set up a meeting with concerned parties. Sheila Adams, Chief Tactics Deputy, appeared before the commission concerning her pending resignation. Ms. Adams expressed her private service and accomplishments over her 18.5 years of service and commended former and present employers and co-workers. After discussion on motion by Terry Cotter, second by Corey Brady, the commission entered an executive session at 10.27 a.m. Present were J.C. Rafferty, Troy Brady, Terry Cotter, Terry Wallace, Tapha Perry, Sheila Adams, and David Kaufman. The commission returned to open session at 10.40 a.m. No decisions were made in the executive session. After discussion on motion by Terry Cartwright, second by Troy Brady, the commission approved the resignation of Sheila Adams contingent on a $1,000 per month retainer for a period of five to six months to be split between the sheriff's tax office salary line and the general county fund for the purpose of training Ms. Adams' successor. Ms. Adams' effective date for her resignation is July 20, 2015. However, she has agreed to work on a contractual basis through November or December. The Commission also approved the advertisement slash job posting for the position of Chief Deputy. Chief Deputy. Applications and resumes will be due by the close of business on Monday, July 13, 2015. The Commission approved the following settlements as listed. The Commission approved the following exonerations and or refunds as listed. With no further business, a motion by Troy Grady, second by Terry Cartwright. The Commission adjourned at 10.50 a.m. Thank you, Jackie. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes as read? If not, I would request uh, a motion to approve the minutes. Is there such a motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. There's still about five minutes before our first appointment, so we'll move down to items for discussion. Thank you again, Jay. Action approval. We have correspondence from Jeffrey M. Armentrout, president of the Upshur County Firefighters Association, providing three nominees for consideration to serve as a member of the Upshur County Fire Board for a three-year term effective July 30, 2015. There's currently one vacancy to fill. Uh, a review of that correspondence reveals <coughs> excuse me, that the three
three names uh, recommended by the Upshur County Firefighters Association to represent uh, uh, on the fire board are Cliff Shaw, Art Wilson, and Gary Bonnet. Uh, these are three names. Normally we have five names requested. These are the three names that they have provided to us. So based on the three names provided, is there a motion to uh, fill that vacancy with one of the uh, individuals contained on the correspondence? I'm willing to please, uh, fill that vacancy with Cliff Shaw. Cliff Shaw? Okay. He's the president of the uh, Silvyville, or excuse me, chief of the Silvyville uh, Volunteer Fire Department. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign motion carries. Uh, we'll contact Mr. Shaw to uh, advise him of that. Uh, and just one correction, that will be effective July 1st, not July 30th. July 1st, very good. Okay, next we have correspondence from David H. Kaufman, Sheriff of Upshur County, requesting employment of Tyler A. Gordon as a probationary deputy sheriff, effective July 12, 2015. Starting pay will be $17 per hour and upon completion of the West Virginia State Police Academy. This will increase to $17.31 per hour. Uh, correspondence from the sheriff indicated that uh, Mr. Gordon has uh, passed civil service testing, the interview, and background checks uh, relative to this application. Uh, is there a motion to uh, approve Sheriff Coppola's uh, request for employment of Tyler A. Gordon as a probationary deputy sheriff? I'm moving. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Both same sign, motion carries. Next, we have correspondence from Perry L. Wallace, County Administrator, requesting the appointment of Sheila M. Adams as a county temporary basis, effective July 21, 2015, at this pay rate of $500 per pay period. The temporary employment will continue through December 31, 2015, unless terminated prior by either party. Uh, and this is to assist the whoever the new uh, tax deputy that will be selected by the sheriff. Uh, this is the purpose of assisting that person in filling the responsibilities of the office, acquainting them with the uh, requirements uh, and, uh, of that position. Uh, That's correct. So the one, transition period. One change, Ms. Adams has changed her actual uh, termination date as far as a full-time employee to July 18, 2015, rather than July 20th. The reason being is that it's at the end of the week, so that will simplify payroll processes for a change from full-time hourly to the temporary salary position. Security the sheriff's office is still going to pick up part of this? Half. Half? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so based on that uh, information we received from Ms. Wallace, uh, is there a motion to approve the request uh, for part-time temporary employment of Sheila Adams? Um, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Motion carries. Next, we have correspondence from Stephen Linger, Director E911, requesting employment of Christina M. Pickens as a part time telecommunicator at the wage rate of $11 per hour and working a maximum of 29.5 hours per week, effective July 19, 2015. Is there a motion to approve uh, that request of Mr. Linger uh, for employment of Christina at Pickens as a part time telecommunicator? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Both same sign, motion carries. It is now 9.15. We have an appointment with Mr. Bill Tenney and Mike Bickle for a discussion regarding statistics on prevailing wage in West Virginia and outside of West Virginia. Bill? Well, hello. Uh, I'm Bill Tenney. I'm the Director of the Office of Prevailing Wage Adjustment and Compensation Services. Uh, I'm going to try to get through all this as fast as I can. Take your time. I'll take care. Uh, you might want to identify yourselves for the viewing audience. We have uh, this on camera, so you might want to identify who you are for the viewing I'm, audience. <laughs> I'm Dole Tenney, and this is Mike Bickle. Mike Bickle. And uh, I have a letter that somebody, the other person that was supposed to come, she couldn't make it because she had to go to the airport to pick up her daughter. Um, she wrote, I'll go ahead and do that first. She wrote, it's Annette Nathan. She works at Arlington, and she's a... Uh, an ATSSA flagger. 
In reference to the record Delta article about prevailing wage in the state and Upshur County, this is my statement. I'm a registered certified ATSSA flagger. My pay rate is found on the West Virginia Wage and Labor website under prevailing wage rate as a class three laborer, not a flagger. The rate of my pay for 2015 in Randolph County this year for my contract awarded in 2014 was $24.86 an hour. Federal portion of pay, which was friends, was $16.30. The state by law does not have the right to pay that portion of pay known as friends or do away with the federal prevailing wage rate if the state takes federal money for public works and or construction projects. The only unfortunate portion of this, under Davis-Bacon, is it gives discretion in the fringe portion of my wages, not to the state, to my employer. The only protection for me under this, under this is that it must be used as a benefit to the employer. She went in to say some examples of uh, how half of her fringe goes into her 401k and half of her fringe into the paycheck. Um, anyway, would you have you provided a copy of that for our records? Uh, if you have a copy, you can provide it to we'll make much up for you. We'll make it for you. Yeah. I'll go into what I will say now. Um, I'm here today to show the members of Upshur County Commission that there is absolutely no proof that a job under $500,000 will cost more if it is done at a less than prevailing wage scale. I have also decided to educate the people of our county and anyone listening on the true economic impact of being left without a prevailing wage until September. September is the date they are supposed to have a finalized wage for contractors to bid off of. I invited two friends to come help explain the reality of the issue. Like they, they're going to net death and obviously that didn't make it. Uh, since I'm allotted 15 minutes, I'm going to go through the information as quickly as possible. And at the end, I will take any questions, questions or concerns about any of the facts that I've read. I will start with why I believe Upshur County should implement the old prevailing wage uh, during the time the state has decided it doesn't need one because it was taken away a lot first. Um, in our state, according to multiple economic studies, our middle class lower wage is supposed to be $27,502 and the upper being $82,506. Now this is coming from Business Insider, but also have uh, uh, the median household income. And even on the U.S. Census Bureau, it says basically what it is. I do realize the per capita income is $19,498, but I researched a few points that make that figure seem ridiculous. Under the SNAP benefit or the SNAP program, a household size of two or more can qualify for government assistance. So under that logic that per capita income is any kind of a basis for what a working person should be paid, and the average household size is 2.5 in this county, then most of the county would qualify for SNAP and government assistance. Is this true? No. Uh, the 2013 Workforce West Virginia average annual wage of a construction worker is $37,465. So if these construction workers are making huge wages, wages, then where are they going on the income charts? Well, some of the construction is residential and the average work hours a construction worker gets in a year is 1,760. There's about 2,080 hours in a year of work if a person is working five, eight, eight hour days per week. I make about $50,000 a year, roughly. Uh, so even if it seems like I'm paid too much, I'm really just middle class. Uh, last year, I did very well because I was working in gas construction, which is not prevailing wage. That's it's my same job, but it, it's not prevailing wage. Uh, I made about $78,000 last year, working six tens. Uh, that is by far the most money I've ever made in my life, but it came at a price. I was working all the time, two and a half hours away, so that's a five hour drive. The now old prevailing wage was at about the right level to make it possible for a person to be in the middle class, raise kids, good credit, buy a nice home, and pay property taxes to the county and not wasting taxpayer dollars on government assistance. I'm a firm believer in lowering taxes and getting people out of poverty. The problem I'm having with the county's ideology is that I can't find a shred of proof on anything on the side of saving taxes can be found. As a matter of fact, the only papers I've found that say it, it does save money for taxpayers have been funded by Charles Koch. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Koch brothers, but a paper written by Andrea M. Dean, uh, Charles G. Koch, Doctorow Fellow, 
on the topic is strongly biased toward, to support Koch's ideology. The Koch's have contributed almost $1.7 million to the West Virginia University Foundation. I have a research paper on how they've been investigated for violation of academic freedom. Anyway, this paper was the paper Bill Cole used to try to convince our state that we didn't need a prevailing wage. Wrong. I have two other economic impact studies that show the real effects regarding prevailing wage or weakening prevailing wage in our state compared to other states. The studies show very good data on how taxpayers and per capita income pay more and get less. Education has a lot to do with why this effect happens. I also found a study that outlines prevailing wage regulations on contractor bid participation and behavior. It outlines uh, many of the misconceptions about bidding practice, practices in a prevailing wage area versus a non-prevailing wage area. What I basically did to determine my conclusion was find every economic study available and read it to find out if it really passed the tax burden onto the county. The evidence shows me, it shows me solid facts. There is absolutely no way that lowering or removing the prevailing wage will lower or pass a tax onto taxpayers of our county. So I'm going to go through some of these little economic studies. This one here was done, it's not for the state, but it's, it's really not a very good one to go off on because it's, it's a, a more in-depth discussion on California. But it does show how prevailing wage works. Uh, there is no consistent evidence that prevailing wage policies impact overall construction costs. Um, they use the software to determine all that stuff. And it shows that the construction costs in no prevailing wage areas are actually higher in the prevailing wage construction areas of, of California. And I think that's it. If you can make copies of those available so we can make a copy for the record. Now this one here was done by the West Virginia Center in Budget and Policy. <clears throat> and this study, to me, is a lot better than the one that was done for the Coke Foundation. Um, it describes the commercial industrial sector of construction. Not the res One big problem with the, the study that was done for the Coke Foundation was that it included residential construction costs into their figures. There's no residential electrician working in industrial or commercial electricity. They'd get shocked and probably die or something. But uh, this one goes into what the construction costs in our state compared to Ohio, Virginia, the five surrounding states. And it says that costs in West Virginia in five neighboring states with or with and without prevailing wage laws found no statistically significant difference in construction costs for elementary schools, secondary schools, and universities between jurisdictions with and without prevailing wage laws. School construction costs in West Virginia were lower per square foot than in the non-prevailing wage states of North Carolina, Ohio, and Virginia. Construction costs per square foot were six dollars and ten cents cheaper for elementary schools, twenty-two dollars and thirty-seven cents cheaper for secondary schools, and fifty-eight dollars and fifty-two cents cheaper for universities in West Virginia than in non-prevailing wage states. Um, studies have also shown that states that have weakened or repealed their prevailing wage laws have not experienced significant savings or job growth. It's got a little graph there to show like the actual cost. Um, inflation adjusted wages for Kansas's construction workers fell by 11% after the repeal of the state's prevailing wage law. Kansas did not build schools any cheaper than its surrounding states that still had prevailing wage laws. The West Virginia Chamber of Commerce claims, this is another thing that happened in Charleston, claims that West Virginia's prevailing wage laws cost the public a minimum of 25% more on public works paid for the public fund, paid for with public funds. It contends that West Virginia's prevailing wage rates are too high, increasing the cost of public construction projects by at least 25%. However, this claim is unrealistic. Uh, this is a, it's a pie chart with a label share of construction value in uh, West Virginia showing how much a job bid basically costs. Well, if labor only accounted for 27.7% on the pie chart of total costs, then it is virtually impossible to reduce 
the total cost by 25% by reducing the state's prevailing wage rates. Um, if the prevailing wage adds 25% to the state's total construction costs, like the chamber claims, then the state should only be spending $800,000 on the project with the prevailing wage adding $200,000 in excess costs. Therefore, the state would have to reduce labor costs from $277,000 to just $77,000 in order to eliminate the 25% increase in total costs that the chamber claims the prevailing wage adds. In other words, labor costs would have to decrease by 72% in order to reduce total costs by 25%. The decline in wages necessary to achieve a 25% reduction in total construction cost is implausibly large. For example, a cement mason or a block heat in Kanawha County would have to have his wages fall from $28.70 per hour under the prevailing wage to just $7.98 an hour below the state minimum wage. And workers would have to be just as productive being paid $7.98 per hour as they were when they uh, were paid $28.70. <clears throat> now this shows the residential average uh, weekly wage versus the non-residential average weekly wage, the commercial industrial sector. Uh, for a, an electrician well, like myself, the residential average weekly wage is $766.15. And for a non-residential average weekly wage, it's $1,153.21. The difference is 50% higher for commercial and industrial. And there's a reason why. I went to Fred Everly for two years and I got an electrician license. There was no way I could possibly go into a gas site or a, uh, into a building with transformers and all kinds of stuff that could blow up in your face and just do that job. There, I, I spent five years going through training to learn what I do. And, I mean, that's, uh, there is a cost to education. All right, well, I'm going to, um, this here is another study. <laughs> that was done, uh, the Affiliated Construction Trades Foundation, a division of West Virginia State Building Trades, funded this study um, to, to basically go against the Foundation. They were kind of aggravated that they that he paid for that. Um, it was done by Michael P. Kelsey from the University of Missouri at the Department of uh, Economics. He's he's the professor down there, and it basically says the same thing. It's fifty dollars and twenty-five cents cheaper per square foot in West Virginia than in non-prevailing wage states. Uh, it says almost the same data. But basically, there's no, there is no tax savings by eliminating the prevailing wage. As a matter of fact, it's going to go, the cost should go up if it's based on everything that's happened outside the state. Um, that's not always the case. I think there was one case where uh, in Ohio, for really cheap elementary schools, the cost was different. Uh, so, I mean, there's not really anything to be saved. The only thing that can definitely be shown is that you are cutting wages for 6% of the county. But... When you say 6% of the county, uh, how, what does that refer to? Well, I'm, I'm assuming that there's a small... That's the construction. It's about... a little chart here. Basically, the most... Most males in this county are employed through construction, or it is the highest employer in Upshur County. That was, I found that on some business and economics website. And then if you look at the uh, West, Workforce West Virginia paper, it shows how many jobs there are too. I've got too many papers here, <laughs> but uh, I'll show you that. In females, it's, it's actually hospitals and nursing and stuff like that. Service industries. Yeah. Um, so I'll go on here. Uh, getting into the reason why our county has a high percentage of per poverty, West Virginia as a whole has the highest income transfer payments in the country. As a share of personal income, these include Social Security benefits, medical benefits, unemployment benefits, and income maintenance benefits. Oddly, the biggest factor, I believe, is medical and Social Security. 
We have a lot of old people. <laughs> we are higher than average on all except unemployment for the, for the country. 11% is the highest one, that's for healthcare costs. We have a lot of people that need to quit smoking and go on all that business, and that's why we're in poverty. One very important thing I figured out in this is that if the state does lower the prevailing wage, the cost of real estate adjusted to inflation must go down, which means property tax, the source of 70-80% of the county's funding, should also go down. In males, construction work accounts for 16%, that was the number, of the total working men. We have 6,680 people working and living in this county, 650 of which work in construction may have families. That goes for both residential and commercial industrial, uh, depending on how much they may draw off the wage. Why work for $25 an hour and the prevailing wage when you can wire up houses as your own contractor for that? I would expect 650 homes at risk of foreclosure or car repossessions, etc. All these things being the main source of tax funding for Upshur County. So if taxes are not going down and wages are, in an obvious way, the taxpayers are being given an, an under the table levy. Also, there's a $20,000 exemption for people on SSI and again for people over the age of 65. The working people are the ones that pay taxes in this county. We're the ones that actually give the county its, its real money. Because we buy things, expensive things, have loans on things, have houses that we have to pay for, and we take care of uh, families inside the house. Well, part of that's having jobs where you have the extra money to be able to do that. Like in Bravo, we're all leisure. You don't need any kind of aerosol gun. For no reason at all. You cut everybody's wage, they're not gonna have the extra money to go to Into Bravo, to go to McFly's, to go to Anderson Outdoors. Walmart will be all right, because you gotta eat, you know what I mean? But once you cut that money, then everybody loses. Eventually businesses will go out because you cut the wages so low that you cannot, you just can't keep together. So when a business goes under, you lose the property taxes for like us, the National Guard Armory, which is a good chunk of money, I assume. So you're not you're, you're hurting everybody. There's no way that anybody benefits out of this at all. Uh, so getting into that, uh, we'll move on to the next part, which is basically five hundred thousand dollars or less. Uh, I have a chart here showing the costs the thresholds across the, the states showing like the, the highest threshold being Maryland at 500,000, Connecticut being 400,000, and going down, as you get down further, we're third from the bottom in per capita income, the middle class income, and all that business. So a $500,000 uh, threshold is kind of ridiculous. It puts a state that has a lower per capita income by far than Maryland. Maryland's the number one in, in middle class income. They're the number one. We're 47. So we're way down at this. And this is one study, uh, but it's, it's pretty much, Maryland's within the top five, and we're within the bottom five. Which, by the way, out of the bottom five, actually out of the bottom 10, like eight of them are no prevailing wage states. So we'd be the first in an entire class of states that it just really goes against uh, what we should be as a state. But uh, moving on to $500,000 is an unfair threshold for prevailing wage. I have a list of all the states, thresholds, median income, sets at 47 of the 50 states, which is $41,253. The only other state to have a $500,000 threshold is Maryland. Maryland sets at number one of the 50 states at $72,483. It doesn't make any sense. To me, a goal, the goal is to find the spot where prevailing wage is not as cost friendly or taxpayer friendly. If you set it too high, taxpayers pay more based on all the studies we mentioned. I think based on jobs I've been on that a cost effective point would be closer to, uh, based on our incomes and the cost, uh, $100,000 to $150,000. Because it's good enough to get something done, but it's not building a mansion. I also think that it's something that should be re revisited every year to determine what is a good cutoff point. I don't believe it's as simple as throwing out the biggest number. Um, uh, a big job takes planning, and when you're looking at a job that's small, the price goes up for bigger contractors because they don't want to take the time to bid on it if it's a few dollars in profit. 
I honestly don't think that it would be a huge difference, but at that price, it may save the county time if they could find someone local to replace the furnace or do some minor networking. Um, I think that's just about all I've got. Mr. Bickle, do you have anything to say other than what you've already expressed? Uh, one, the only thing I have with the $500,000, what you'll find, it'll start happening is instead of bidding the whole job at like two million dollars people will start breaking it down before the state bids so each of them will be at five hundred thousand dollars or less therefore they'll get the bus on the prevailing wage they'll have the contractor bid it four times i've seen it happen so they that's like their loophole to get out of it you, you drop it so low that they can't do that then it's actually a fair fair playing field for local contractors and out-of-state contractors at that point. Have you uh, taken a survey of the state as to which counties have uh, indicated they will remain under the old prevailing wage rate? We would on? be the first currently. Kanawha County hasn't passed anything on that yet. Uh, I'm sure Kanawha and Cabell are going to continue to support that. It's, it's beneficial to their local economy. Um, I think that our county should do the same, uh, just to continue paying the old prevailing wage. As a sign that we're not against the middle class, we're you know, trying to save taxpayer dollars. Now, you're not going to see an impact it's in the first year of this happening or nothing like that. This takes years, all right? Two years, three years down the road, you're going to see massive changes if we were to, if we were to repeal or lower these wages and stuff. I have a little article where uh, Wisconsin basically they say, well, the company came up from Georgia and they were going to be cheaper and prevailing wage is bad because we lost taxpayer dollars. Now, that company came up from Georgia to Wisconsin to get higher wages. That's bad. That's not a good thing at all. Like, you should be protecting your local economy. Local workers, not giving it to Georgia. I mean, that's, that's what prevailing wage was about. It was about trying to make the market friendly to local economies. You can't go... If New York went without prevailing wage, there would be nobody in New York working, and every house up there would go down in value pretty quick because yeah, these people in Alabama and Louisiana and these southern states that don't that are right to work no prevailing wage and all this business, they make eleven dollars an hour. If they can come up to New York and make thirty dollars an hour, they're making a lot of money in their own local economy. That's where the problem is with all this. West Virginia being a northern state surrounded by uh, high wage states, all right, we have to keep our wages high or these states just the same will come up here from the south and take our work. It's not rocket science to me, it's pretty simple. Mr. Tenney, I have a question, just to clarify. Are you asking the Upshur County Commission to simply declare that they will continue to pay prevailing wage for Upshur County Commission projects or set a law for the entire county to pervade? pay prevailing wage? Uh, whatever the county is capable of doing. That was, okay. Whatever the old law was, I understand that the, the threat, there was no threshold before. Correct. We, you had uh, instances wherein anything that we put out was prevailing wage with public money. Now there's an instance I'm aware of where a uh, volunteer organization that receives public monies was able to uh, have some work done on the building that they occupy uh, and they entered into an agreement with some local individuals uh, for a specific rate. The job was completed and then it was determined that rather than private organization funds being used, it was public funds being used. So then they had to go back and re-calculate uh, the, the, the pay you know, for the individuals that did that particular job. Uh, the issue for us as a commission is that we are responsible for expenditure of public monies, which you've indicated are tax monies. Uh, we operate strictly, most of our money comes from property tax. People that are taxpayers that pay uh, property tax and then entrust uh, the commission to make decisions on the expenditure of those funds in a prudent and responsible manner. Um, 
when the statute was changed earlier this year, which you're discussing, which you are advocating uh, against by the state legislature, that places us in a position where uh, you know, we have to make a decision. We have to make decisions on uh, expending public funds. Uh, and if you are to recall, a uh, year and a half, two years ago, I guess about a year and a half, our budget, we were a $400,000 shortfall for what our previous income was. So we had to tighten our belt quite substantially. You know, I imagine in the course of your own life, when you, you know, I'm not, it's not that I'm not sympathetic to what you're saying and, and to many ways, degrees, but from my perspective, it's incumbent on us to spend for whatever we expend public monies for to try to obtain the most uh, efficient, cost-efficient uh, results. No more the different than a family. If a family uh, can shop at two locations for the same product or roughly the same product, uh, most families are going to purchase the product that is reasonable to them that means meets their needs and necessities but is more you know, financially viable. Uh, it's I think trying to you know, sort through this it's very sometimes difficult. It is difficult as you I, I, I appreciate and I know the sincerity that you you know have uh, done your studies and, and but we, again, we always have conflicting reports. You know, you know, if, I will if, say that the old, the old story is that what numbers, what is it, numbers, uh, you can figure, but uh, you know, figures have, are always open to interpretation as to how you. you, know, I, you know, I have more numbers. to indicate what I have said. And I, right. I, like I said before, right. this is me looking at every study. There are only two that suggest negative impacts uh, or the uh, positive, positive impacts. impacts. So there's no, there's, and uh, there's a lot more data on tax and, and cost effectiveness and locally economy efficiency there. It's not. Um, well, I know that you've expressed your concerns to the members of the commission as well. I yeah. believe they, well, I can't speak for them, but uh, I am you know, um, do any other commissioners wish to comment? No, I think we pretty well covered our responsibilities. It's, uh, it's not often an easy job, as one commissioner has said every Thursday when we make a decision. We disappoint someone, except he doesn't use the word disappoint. <laughs> we disappoint someone. Uh, but we do have that responsibility. And I, as I understand your concerns, and I really do understand your concerns, I would hope you understand our concerns as well, because uh, the responsibility that we have, we take seriously. Uh, we see we see all too often in state government, nations even, in today's world, where if fiscal responsibility for the public isn't handled in a you know, proper way, it can lead to serious results that affect many, many people beyond just those you know, involved uh, in, in making a decision to uh, follow what the legislature has mandated. If you know, we've made a decision that in projects under you know, $500,000, uh, we would uh, put them out for bid and accept the low, lowest qualified bidder. We have very few projects at the county level that would be over half a million dollars. I don't know of any that would be forthcoming that would be over half a million dollars, but say we're going to comply with the law. There is some indication that uh, part of the reasoning was that the organization is responsible for providing information to establish prevailing wage rates was not forthcoming. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, what actually happened was they requested the, the data and they got exactly what data they wanted. The problem was that 
it wasn't in their best interest, the data. Their best interest being whose best interest? <laughs> well, the GFP down there. Um, what they wanted was, personal belief here, this is opinion, what they wanted was to see a wage decrease, it, like cut in half or something, and they didn't get that. Whenever you're looking at the per capita income, you know how that was, that, that's what they're hoping for. All right, they want to see something like that. All right, that's not reality, but the reality is that you have educated people sitting here doing these jobs. I'm not saying all of us are equal in the construction force. I mean, obviously, if you're painting a building or whatever, there's a big difference between painting a wall and, and wiring up a wire. Electrical work, right. Yeah, but it's... Wired skills. But they didn't get what they asked for, and I think I think that is the real reason why they said no, that ain't gonna work. And I also believe they wanted to see this state without a prevailing wage for a while. Um, I don't understand what, what they're thinking down there, but well, to that end, of course, we are. And I've said a number of times, legislature mandates the county commission. We are a creature of the of the state legislature. We're authorized to do. We have little uh, authority, if any, outside what the legislature, state legislature, authorizes county commissions in general to do. That's uh, why I was asking if you were requesting that the commission make the entire county a prevailing wage county or just simply commission projects, because they wouldn't have the ability to require a private contractor to pay prevailing wage. They personally could request that any of the construction projects that they need completed on their property be prevailing wage. But they couldn't require that of any other. Okay, well, then that, that is what I'd like, to, I'd like to see a motion to see some uh, at the Upshur County, whatever the Upshur County can pay to be prevailing wage. I, except I do understand the threshold issue. Uh, I don't think the threshold should be five hundred thousand dollars. Know, I think it should be more likely close to the actual cost effectiveness area, which is probably between one hundred and two hundred. I can't say exactly what right. it would be. I, that's something that. I don't think anybody can really say. I think they just throw out numbers based on what I've seen. But being number one at 500,000 Maryland and being 47, that is a monster threshold. I, I guess it, it's, you know, it's, not a, it's not a satisfactory answer, I know. But the remedy is to is through the electoral process. The remedy to address your issue that you're talking about, the way in which the statute is worded and how it impacts on prevailing wage, uh, and how it impacts on public expenditures and counties and cities that have to responsibility for public works and whatever, is, is through, the, through the ballot box, is through the, through the you know, franchise. Uh, it is, but the, the is, county commission does have the authority to to enact its own rules. We can, we, uh, under, the, under the existing, as I understand, the existing uh, statute or legislation relative to prevailing wage, we can you know, maintain prevailing wage, but I do not believe it is the, uh, has been stated in the previous two votes, it is not the will of the county commission, I'm sure, county, to, uh, to follow that request. We, to a person, believe that expenditure of public funds should be done in a very prudent and fiscally responsible manner. And if the law allows, which it does allow, that contracts under $500,000 are not required to be prevailing wage, we've taken a position that we will put those contracts out for bid and that the you know, lowest acceptable qualified bidder would be, would be the one that received the contract. We have done many projects, quite frankly, in the past not large projects where we've used our own staff and crew that work for the county to do projects uh, for construction within the courthouse complex or on county property as a means of saving money for the taxpayers. Uh, unless you sit this bench up here and have, have to answer to the public There'll be people today that will approach us or call us on the phone who will be upset that we did not uh, I just want to accept your argument. 
and the lovely people will call us and say thank you for saving the taxpayers money. It's not always a black and white issue. It always isn't something that you can, you know that immediately when you make a decision that you've made the right decision. <coughs> what it is that you hope in, in, in conference with each other when we make these decisions, when we bring our, our own experiences, our own uh, ideas of governance to, to, to make a decision that we do that, which is in the best interest of everyone, not just a segment. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and, and say I'm sympathetic to your position, and yet vote contrary to your position. Because there's two, there's two, uh, there's, there's, there's two tugs here. One's from sympathy for the working man wanting them to make a good living wage. But the other side is, I have to make a decision, we have to make decisions that are proper for the benefit of the entire county. Right. Uh, we just wanted you to hear. Well, maybe, and, I, and I know that each of us well, appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate your hearing. Absolutely. And we always, and I've said before, and other commissioners have said the same, that we want the public, there'll be issues that this whole courtroom will be filled with people who have opinions and ideas about uh, different issues that are presented before us. And that's what government's all about. As long as we, you know, you are exercising what few people seem to have an idea about today. You're coming forward with, you know, a grievance or a, or a, or a position that you advocate because you have passion for that. Many people don't even vote today. What was the last percentage of vote we had in Upshur County last election? 12%? 12%? of the people in this county voted in the last, last election. And yet, when you're voting, you're electing people like us to represent you. We're imperfect in many ways, I know that for a fact. But it is what it is. It is the system that we have. People like yourselves who come up and, and make your representation, I appreciate that because that is what this essence of what we have in this country is all about. God forbid we ever lose it. We have to be careful. More people need to be involved. Uh, to that degree, I know you're disappointed in what I've said, and I'm sorry for that. I truly am. But it has been the decision of the commission. Uh, it's most likely going to be the decision of the majority of commissions in the state because the financial situation you paint it is reality. And we have to respond to that reality. I wish it were not so. But, you know, but I, I think as much as you've supported your position here, I think your voice should be brought to a different level, as I've said, the, the franchise, your ability to vote, to change, change the legislature change the representation that you have in the legislature. That is where the answer is to the questions you raise. I, I don't know if, but anyway, that's, that, that, any other commissioners have any statements? Uh, Mr. Kimball? I'm Jerry Kimball. Uh, a while ago you mentioned something about people that were on Social Security. Yes. About taxes. I'm on Social Security. I pay taxes on my house, my garage, my property, three vehicles, and you know, I mean, I, just the same as everybody else does. Yeah, but what I was getting at with that wasn't that it didn't have to do with uh, whether or not a person on Social Security is below or above anybody else. It's you get a twenty thousand dollar homestead exemption. All right, so you pay less in taxes versus property. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that. Working people don't get any exemptions. They have to pay their taxes. And I, I went through that too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I was saying the majority of property taxes come from working people. We pay our pensions. Yeah. Mr. Tenney, Mr. Pickle, we do appreciate your taking the time to come and make your presentation to us. Did you all have anything else? Any other comments? No, I do appreciate Dual. Mike, take the time out of your busy schedule. I know Dual that we have had conversation and reference this and how you come into the county commission. But with that being said, 
I think you brought several points, at least to me, that I was unaware of. But with that being said, if there is a bid here, you all may know it's over a certain amount, 15000 we have to put it out for bid. And I know the union's not concerned about anything twenty or 25000 They're wanting major jobs. But it's not just the union. I mean, it's not the union, too. It's everyone. But uh, with that, with that being said, I'm sure that if the union would come in with a bid, you know what I mean, that was less than a labor contractor here, that that bid would be accepted by this commission, you know what I mean, because we do look at the lowest bid, and we're all concerned about doing the best we can for the citizens of Lipsha County, all three of us. Uh, and I understand your point, the more money you make, the bigger house, the more taxes you pay, the more money you spend at Walmart, Kroger's, all the places in Upshur County, which makes a business fine. I see that point too, and, and we all see that point. But with that being said, we all have to do what we think is best, you know what I mean, for the citizens of Upshur County. Yeah. I kind of understand, but I totally disagree. I feel like uh, there's, there's a, a tax fact method, and then there's a political belief policy that most people have. If you were sitting here, yeah. if I was if sitting were, there, I would take If you were it sitting here, then would, <laughs> you might have a different, I'm not saying you would have a different, but it, it, there may be other, other issues that come to bear. That, help you formulate an opinion. As Mr. Brady has said, Commissioner Brady has said uh, many times since his uh, election, uh, until you sit here in these three seats, you really don't know what the job is. You can think you know what it is, you can anticipate what it is during a campaign or from talking to people that have sat here, but until you personally occupy the position these three seats and have to make the decisions and have to uh, disappoint people and have to uh, help people, people that are you know, positively affected. Uh, every issue has its, every issue appearing before us has its detractors and supporters and uh, it's not easy. You sometimes lose friends. You sometimes lose people you thought were your friend uh, because of the decision you've made. But as long as you believe the decision you made is the right one for the most people, the one that you know, the people have put you here to, to serve, uh, that's how you're able to, to, to uh, maintain it. Okay. This that girl, she's uh, she's non-union and she's also. Well, it's not a union issue. No, no, it's not a union issue. Just throw that out there. I can, no, I can assure just you. That. No, I can assure you. There are people out there. Well, I don't know. This is not a this is not a union or non-union <laughs> issue. This is strictly, from my perspective, uh, trying to, to be uh, efficient, uh, the most cost-effective for the with the public's money, the public's funds. That's that's the only issue. I'm not a I'm not yeah, the the issue the non-union issue or the union is not uh, my decision is not there on that strictly a matter of economics, trying to do the most with the least in terms of your funding. And if you did a survey, I don't think you'd find anybody out there in Upshur County that wouldn't like to be making more money, living in a better home, got a bigger car, have more money to spend here in Upshur County. If you did a survey, everybody would want that. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> Thank you again, gentlemen. Can I have a short recess so I can make this coffee? Sure. Yes. We'll have, have a 10 minute recess. Thank you again. Thanks, Bill. Okay, we'll return for recess. We are now back in open session of uh, the County Commission. Uh, our next appointment, as I stated earlier, is at 2 o'clock with the County, Upshur County EMS and the ESP relative to a mutual aid agreement, possible mutual aid agreement. So our next item for discussion, action, or approval is correspondence from Laura Ragland, who uh, is with West Virginia Matters, which is an environmental group, I believe, uh, requesting a response to questions relative to emergency planning and water quality 
regarding the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and Mountain Valley Pipeline. That response has been prepared by our Director of Office of Emergency Management uh, and has been sent to Ms. Ragland, I believe, uh, in response. That copy of that response is located in the agenda minutes for, for the public to come in if they, not agenda minutes, the agenda, today's agenda. The copy of the response is not in here because it was just compiled, okay. drafted oh, yesterday. Oh, it's not yet, okay. So I can't provide you the copy if you take it. Okay, very good. Okay, that didn't require any action. Okay, we have approval of the West Virginia Division of Highway Structures Division General Sketch Sheet, dated July 2, 2015, for repair of the Youth Camp River Ridge. That's located on page 14, and you can review that schematic. Print. This was a stipulation of a contract you signed for the repair that you would approve a sketch. So that's why this is on today's And uh, it has been submitted by the West Virginia Division Highway Structures Division and indicates apparently that some of the uh, foundation has issues with concrete uh, and therefore the sketch refers to, uh, from a layman's perspective, repair of some of the concrete abutments and structures. Is that how you interpret it? Uh, Thanks, so. Have you had a chance to look at it, buddy? Is that your interpretation? That's mine, too. Installing some wire mesh, anchors, and forms for MC Creek. So, having said that, is there a motion to approve the uh, sketch provided by the West Virginia Department of Highways? Uh, relative to the repair of the Youth Camp River Bridge. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign, motion carries. And we have a notice, uh, approval for a notice effective July 1, 2015 regarding the Utilization Emergency Operations Center. This is a uh, notice which has been submitted to various organizations which are using and have used the meeting room at the 911 center, uh, changing some policy relative to access to that location. Uh, this is uh, in consideration of uh, increasing the security of that facility as required by both the Criminal Justice Information Services security policy, that is the FBI uh, Criminal Justice Information Services Center, which we utilize for running uh, record checks, criminal record checks, and stolen property checks. Uh, they do require that the facility where this uh, computer terminal located be maintained in a uh, secure manner. And also the uh, security policy and national infrastructure protection plan, which I believe is under uh, FEMA. So in order to ensure that we comply with grants, and contracts we've entered into with uh, various uh, agencies uh, this require us to uh, affect a, some change to the uh, access policy to the 911 center. So as we stated that, is there a motion to adopt the policy for the reasoning and I set forth as is set forth in the notice, uh, printed notice as well. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign, motion carries. And of course, part of that is that any organization that would be affected by this uh, has the option of using the commission chambers uh, for their meetings uh, if uh, necessary, and plus there, there's no other commission business uh, being held at that time. Next, we have for your information items. Correspondence from Michael A. Albert, Chairman of the Public Service Commission of West Virginia, appointing Jacqueline McDaniel, excuse me, as a member of the Board of Directors of the Upshur County Solid Waste Authority to a term expiring June 30, 2019. We have cor correspondence from Charles McKinney, Assistant Chief Inspector, Chief Inspection Division of the Office of State Auditor, uh, setting forth a report uh, on applying agreed upon procedures of the Upshur County Magistrate for the period ending December 31, 2014. This report being made available for public review in the Usher County Commission Office. We have correspondence for Ray Tomlin, Governor, approving a STOP or Stop Violence Against Women Act grant for the Usher County Commission, the amount of $30,700. We 
and of course, violence with Governor Earl Ray Tomlin approving a community corrections program grant to the Upshur County Commission, the amount of $204,676. We have an article fund for that provided to the County Commission requested to be put in our agenda by the Tobacco Prevention Coalition, Upshur County Organization, which sets forth the economic impact of cigarette butt litter. It's an article that uh, they provided to the Commission for for uh, approval or for our placement in the uh, agenda, not for our approval. Uh, the Upshur County Building Permits are for June 2015, which I think came out to over a million and a half dollars in uh, construction permits uh, provided during uh, 2015, which is always a good sign that people are being, uh, fixing their homes or building new homes or businesses. We have invitation to the Upshur County Development Authority Board of Directors meeting to be held August 5th, 12 o'clock p.m., and that's going to be at the conference center, I believe, on Brushy Fork Road. We have Upshur County Health Department newsletter for July 2015. We have agendas and notices of meetings. We have meeting minutes, various meetings that are upcoming. That many of the meetings are attended by uh, members of the commission or our staff during the month. Various boards that we Assigned. We have appointments needed upcoming for various boards, and the next regular meeting will be a week from today on July 16, 2015. Is there any additional business pending before the uh, commission at this time from the public? But, um, if not, we will take care of our bills.